so my name is Nabendu. Uh, <laughs> currently an engineer with Haptic. Uh, so basically, if how many of you actually know about Haptic? Like, just want to have a quick hands. Perfect. Uh, so Haptic is a startup which is running for the last four years and so. Uh, so primarily we started with an M-commerce kind of uh, you know view where you know uh, you, we have our app and then you can check. Uh, with our bot and then make or uh, you know get things done it could be flight booking printing everything uh, so <clears throat> when when it worked we found out that you know uh, at that point of time like three three and a half years back our ml engine was not so great right obviously uh, we had, we were just started with nlp and all sort of stuff uh, we realized that a lot of our chats uh, were not being handled by the bot and we decided to break those chats and you know, give an actual human being to take to and then reply to the user so that the user experience enhances. Which led to us to create a chat application. Uh, this, if I would give you an example, would most probably be like WhatsApp web, uh, where you know, uh, people can come in and you know, each chat, when it, uh, it get, if the bot doesn't understand, it comes to you and then assistant that we have at our on premises could actually answer to your query. Uh, so, uh, just to go, uh, before we go forward, uh, we would like to just tell you a few things. Uh, we are Python workshop at uh, Haptic, right? So, most of the people uh, who come in as an engineer are primarily working on Python and all sort of stuff. So, we are very new to the front-end uh, architecture stack. Uh, but we could understand that the uh, legacy client-server architecture won't work here. Uh, obviously, right? Because uh, there is a lot of things that has to be taken care of. Uh, there has to be sockets and all sort of stuff so that the each chat can come in very quick and you can reply and all happens very instantaneously. So we uh, uh, put out few uh, to do's. Uh, so we thought that we first have to separate the front end from back end. Uh, remember, we are the back end back end engineers talking about this, and then we wanted to make different teams uh, able to work in parallel. Uh, by which I mean that you know, uh, few people can build the REST APIs which can be consumed by the front end apps, obviously, and then wanted to make it look great. Uh, this was our very first you know, customer facing app, so we wanted to look it you know, nice and clean. So, uh, I think most of you might have done this uh, earlier as well. So, two and a half years back, we started with HTML, CSS, and jQuery. Uh, please notice HTML, CSS, and jQuery. These are mentioned three. Separately, because we are a bunch of backend engineers, had nothing to you know deal with all sort of stuff before, and uh, suddenly we figured out okay, we need to work on this stuff. What we realized that you know we started off very quickly and easily. Uh, we started delivering products, and obviously we started writing a lot of code, uh, and our life felt very simple. Uh, we are up and running with the chat application in about two to one half months. Uh, it's simple jQuery, HTML, and CSS, and as the product manager could see that you know we, we had a lot of improvements and the things are working really well, they started coming up with lots of new features. And we are very enthusiastic, we started keep on adding them and then we found out okay, it's, it's working fine, we are adding a lot of codes, we are building products, you know, shipping new features every day and, and sort of stuff. Until we realized that you know our system is becoming very slow. Uh, by which I mean that you know, uh, if someone comes in with a chat and then uh, you tend to reply to the chat and then you need something else to be opened up in your tab or something like that, it was, it would take a lot of time. You would uh, uh, each and every chat that was coming in, uh, we uh, we were taking a lot of time actually trying to figure out the, how the UI works or wait for the UI to respond before actually actually put actually uh, serve the user. And this was a big problem for us. Right, so because we uh, wanted to create a product which would make our life simpler, but instead it was making things tougher as we go on. Uh, and we wanted to build product very fast, we wanted to add new features. And suddenly we started finding out people coming to us and telling this. Imagine you are in a fast paced startup and then the devs you are working on currently come up and say that I can't touch this piece of code because it's too dangerous for me to touch at this moment at this last stage of release as it, as it might break other stuff right uh, because we are, we are building so complicated system in fact the system was not complicated we made it complicated to be very frank enough 
with all the jquery event handling even bubbling and all sort of uh, jargon so all sort of stuff which we never knew before right we eventually you know uh, uh, saw that those things were hampering our user experience a lot and obviously the assistants are also not so great about handling those kind of stuff so we decided okay let's give a um, quick uh, like let's take a step back and see what's going wrong over here so we started uh, debugging like you know what what, uh, what what is the problem and you know what's causing this kind of delays or sluggishness of the ui so we found three major problems right uh, the first problem being whenever something changes in an application right you can say that the state of the application has changed right and whenever you wanted to see what has changed or what is the current state of application we always needed to query the dom right uh, for simple example i could say is if, if i say the whether the exception is online or offline and based on that if i have if i have to you know uh, do something else i would actually see the let's let's give a very simple example right? i would see the green or yellow or red uh, uh, purple that you would keep up uh, whether the uh, assistant is or the user is online or offline you would read the color of it and find out whether it is offline or online so when the entire state of the application were residing in the dom right you would just keep on data attribute and we will find out that two people are writing same data and attributed it to different ways and to different places it was not making any sense and rather than the actual html code it was more of the data that was residing in the html and this was really really hampering our user experience or let's just say how we progress with our next uh, stuff of processing also there are multiple sources of truth in the application one could say that the uh, the assistant is or the user is online by seeing multiple different thing someone read that if the color of the bubble is red that means he is offline someone will see if the text is offline he is offline and different other things or someone will see the data attribute whether it says on and off so there are multiple sources of truth in our dom and everybody uses it differently and that that obviously you know uh, leads to a lot of errors and issues in our application and one strange thing that happened was people are keep on adding event listeners right on uh, this is i'm not uh, no pinning this up but at some point of time we figured out the simple button had the more more than 15 of event listeners a simple button which would do the same exact thing because someone would know would not know uh, if somebody else has created a separate js file because obviously we are in jquery so we, we didn't have any on a bundle or something sir so we had 10 15 html or js loaded in our html and somebody would add a separate uh, event in a separate js file i would never know right and then i would still add and then i'll i'll be like it was working one while i was working on my dev now what's not working obviously that people or a few other people might have just used prevent default or right? just gone like you know everything is working in your staging environment and you go to production nothing is working what is happening like you know i have written my code perfectly fine but it's not working so these are the three uh, major problems we saw uh, that was causing lot of issues in our system uh, be it the sluggishness of the uh, system because for every time we do something not just updating the dom to read out the state of the system we are reading from the dom and obviously there are multiple sources of truth it was become very difficult for us to maintain what makes sense or what is the correct way of defining some structure i'll just give a very quick example over here this was a very small component or like to say jquery thing that we had and it's just a switch it's just a on and off right it's just a very simple piece of code uh, and then you could see there are two things i marked is that uh, one uh, says check that means it's on and something else says on like on and off the trigger thing right we actually found out two devs using this particular element and to read the state of the application in different way somebody was reading the checkbox uh, input type whether it's checked or not checked and someone else was reading whether the text is on and off right this was a very very huge problem for us because we could understand that if you still if if you, if you keep uh, going forward like this there will be a uh, problem where two days might fight with each other no this is the right thing to do uh, you should not change it or i may simply uh, like change on to active some some other day and then some something will just you know break so we had a very good realization uh, obviously we had spent around two and a half months just building the product and it was looking great until then we realized that you know this is not the way we should move forward and then we should think about something else which will actually solve our real life problem so i 
again, when we researched uh, with different other companies uh, at Bay Area or some other you know, local companies and what, how they are actually solving these kind of problems, we could figure out these few things which are definitely needed if we are moving from jQuery to any other framework, right? First of all, we should need some state-based framework, meaning that for anything and everything, if, you are, if I were to find out the state of the application, I should never query the DOM, right? Obviously, you could add some kind of uh, your persistent uh, JavaScript store or something of that sort in your existing jQuery code and make this happen. But then it won't be persistent, right? You can't guarantee that this particular state and your actual DOM are always in sync. So we wanted to look for some application or framework which is state-based. Like the primary way that uh, framework works is based on states. We wanted to be predictable and production gate, right? So we thought that jQuery has more than 40,000, 50,000 downloads and we are facing this kind of issues. We don't, did not want to take any other major chances with anything and everything will come forward, right? So we wanted to do a uh, very brief analysis of all the tech stack out there and find out which works best for us. Obviously, we wanted it fast and lightweight uh, because that was one of the reasons we wanted to move out of jQuery and the obviously normal uh, JavaScript code because it was not fast and as we keep building stuff, it was getting slower and slower. So we wanted something fast and obviously lightweight. jQuery itself came around with 190 KB and with all different uh, files that we were creating, it was just a complete mess, right? And uh, we never knew as a backend engineer, you know, we should, like, you know, we should build a uh, bundle all those steps together because nobody in the jQuery forum actually taught us about that. And obviously we wanted to build great looking UIs, right? With jQuery, this is something really simple, right? You can uh, plug and play lots of libraries out there which are uh, really great looking and you know, uh, gives a lot of features to you. And the last thing was very important for us, right? We wanted something that is very easy to learn. Uh, because uh, the problem that we face, right, uh, is a fast moving startup and we had built a very solid framework or system where everything was working on uh, state machine or messaging queues, right? Uh, for someone who is very new to the system, uh, like let's just say we want to hire some very professional front end engineer, to make them understand the entire architecture or the tech stack or how the system works, it would take more, at least a month or so before we can actually begin to proceed and create a new application. So we wanted our existing people who are working on jQuery, uh, who had a very good, uh, okay amount of understanding about JavaScript, how it works, to actually able to pick this framework up and then go forward. So I think uh, many of us still face this problem. There are too many choices, right? Uh, the most obvious stable errors is Angular, and then people are using Ember, Backbone, ESTJs, Knockout, React, and whatnot, right? So we are overwhelmed by all these choices, right? We are like, okay, fine. Again, let's take a step back and see, you know, like what uh, what of the libraries brings to us, and you know how we can, you know. Uh, what benefits it gives us rather than just you know, going and uh, figuring out an uh, application just go about it, right? So we started with Angular and it felt very simple, right? Uh, the first ex Angular example that you saw in the, uh, and this Angular, I'm talking about Angular 1, uh, not Angular 4. Uh, we went to the WZ school, uh, yeah, it was a uh, you know, very famous uh, website in our uh, JavaScript framework back then. Uh, we went to W school and found out that you know I could type in a simple text box and then uh, I could see that the same thing is getting updated in my separate area of the top, right? We are like, wow, this is wonderful. We realized one problem here. We realized that any 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 sort of uh, like if I could just go to the console and update this text via normal JavaScript, still the same thing would happen. We didn't want to uh, uh, make the or no, we were not quite happy with that, right? Uh, because again, it, 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 it didn't make sense, like it, there could be multiple sources of truth over here. People, they, uh, anything and everything can change the state of the application and then something would happen. We were not so sure if it's the right one. Ember, like, uh, I think we spent five minutes for Ember, to be very frank enough. Uh, like, it was just some other language, we didn't think it was JavaScript. Uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, if any Ember developer, we seriously don't want to, you know, like, uh, we don't have any uh, anything on that, but then yeah, it felt like that. Uh, backbone, we heard about it, we saw, again, mm, it didn't make sense. Right? EXT is obviously it was uh, licensed, so knocked out, uh, simulated the knockout. And then uh, we saw React. <clears throat> so one problem we had at that time, uh, we had big dreams. Uh, we thought, you know, uh, we could potentially be, you know, fighting against Facebook or some other sort. So we saw React comes with PSD license. 
right? Uh, that was again some sort of drawback for us. Uh, what if we write the entire application someday Facebook comes and say that they can't use React? So we started uh, seeing, you know, what what if that happens, right? Uh, like what will happen to us, and then you know, again, do we need to react the entire application again? Uh, we saw that uh, obviously at that point of time, you could understand that there is some kind of bundle, and uh, you could uh, bundle all of your JavaScript uh, code together, and then uh, ship that code. We are using Browserify at that point of time when we started with uh, React. So we found out that uh, if you are using web paper or something like that, uh, there is something called LISS and all, right? So we could use some other library which works like React, but just uh, change a simple piece of code uh, in our web paper configuration and everything will start working, right? So Inferno at that point of time was a big supporter for us. I am not so sure if anybody has heard about Inferno. Uh, it's a React-like architecture uh, framework. Uh, it's not React. It's not so small, obviously. It's in, uh, it has most of the uh, APIs that React offers, uh, but it's MIT licensed. And but uh, it was MIT licensed at that point of time. It was uh, very small in size, and it was uh, we could just uh, we we did a small POC uh, where we built a React application like POC small, and then we changed in our webpack uh, the LIS to Inferno and it started working. So we thought, okay, fine, let's take this chance. If if, if uh, something happens, we'll just move to uh, Inferno if, if that's required. Uh, hopefully, that is not required anymore. Uh, React is MIT license now, and we are very happy about it. Yeah. Right. Uh, so why React? Uh, obviously, I've spoken about a lot on the previous slide, but that that was not the uh, the drawbacks of other frameworks was not the actual reason to choose React. Right. It was the other around mostly. Uh, React was offering us a lot more than you know uh, what we could think of, and it made sense to us, right? The other three uh, primary things that uh, you know uh, made us to decide for React, right? First of all, the state-based architecture, right? Uh, we initially loved, we just fell in love with this uh, concept that you know your state is the source of truth, be your application or be your DOM, right? Anything and everything that your DOM represents is some sort of state that is behind that. Right? I could simply create an application or simple component, right, uh, which says uh, in name. I could simply uh, pass a property to it, and then it would just just display that name, right. So every time I update this particular uh, variable, my DOM will get updated. This means two things. First of all. I don't need to directly manipulate my DOM, as Manjula said, right? Uh, manipulating and you know working with DOM is a tedious process, and sometimes uh, you know you need to be very you know uh, have a very good un understanding how things work at DOM level. So React was taking away that from us, obviously. Uh, and then second thing is like it was very predictable, right? The only way the name of the particular component would change if I pass as some kind of prop to it. Let's just say uh, later on that you will find out the name is getting changed. Some some or other way, and this is not what we are expecting. I can single pointedly tell that someone is passing a wrong prop to it, right? And I could figure out what all uh, components or what all uh, actions are triggering a particular event, and I can debug those, which was very difficult in jQuery, like if, uh, or Angular, let's say, right? I could simply go into the console and write something else, and then things will just start breaking. I will never know that somebody actually was so intelligent enough to go to the console and do this. I would just spend two days finding out what I did wrong. Right. So this was this was a very big win for us. Uh, we are something we are looking for something like that, uh, which is completely driven by state, and uh, you know, uh, entire application is state based, where anything and everything that happens in the application has to go through the state. Uh, the data flow, which uh, you know also helped us the data flow X. Uh, it's it's so one way data flow, right? The DOM will get updated only if the state changes. Right, and I, I, as a JavaScript uh, come, uh, programmer, I can define what changes my state. I can put a limit to it. I can simply say that okay, if you want to change the state of this particular thing, you can only do this via this. Right. So, anybody who, who is coding in this particular application, uh, I, I believe that most of you, if you are already working on React or you know going to work in React, and this is a, a good opportunity for you to find out how things are working. Probably might not have only one dev, right? There will be multiple devs working on the same project. So React is, we feel that's very good at that particular aspect. I think many of us don't talk about it very openly, but React is very good when there is multiple team or multiple people working on a particular project, right? Because it helps uh, 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 shorten down your uh, development cycle, uh, reduces your bugs, obviously, 
and because of the one way data flow we are pretty sure that whatever you do in your application has some kind of implication or it is it is the way that things are happening right we could simply go back and find out this is something that is working obviously the apis uh, the, by api the completely mean that the entire architecture right is the life cycle methods uh, it's the component uh, component driven nature of react right uh, and it makes sense to us obviously right the apis are so beautifully written and also the documentation at the end of file uh, i think view just beats react's documentation at this point but then back when we started with react right the documentation was just a place right uh, we, we, with just a very little knowledge of javascript we could actually start digging uh, what was working for react and how things were working over there so we found out the apis are very useful for us uh, very simply put right uh, our most of the things that was happening in the application was some sort of ajax call right rest api understanding right so it was clearly mentioned in the document right that if you want to do some kind of rest api calls please do it in a component mount right like we didn't want to go to any other third party or people ask like you know like why should i do this it was completely written in the documentation and all sort of things so it, it made sense to us and all the life cycle method were very useful for us to make the entire application so we decided with react you know and the, our entire application is running on jquery right now jquery is coming says how do you like you know how do you port this entire application right it was it was uh, uh, so first of all we started creating small pocs right uh, by small pocs that my right the first pocs that we created was our simply the footer component the footer component simply said copyright optical right the first thing we did was create this uh, like small component and then put it up there uh the one great thing about react is right uh, you don't necessarily need your entire application to be built on react right you could use the way the you know uh, uh, existing uh, uh, javascript uh, framework work, right I, in this case we just include the react and react dom library as a some, uh, simple cdn files and then we wrote the simple uh, uh, javascript code and then we just import it in the html itself how you used to do for a uh, normal jquery application right it started working for us we felt confident obviously uh, we could we could think that okay small small part of the application can uh, shift to this react and then potentially at the end of the day you can say that okay man this is working for us and then we would completely shift to react we started with stateless component uh stateless components are pure function which just take some kind of property and display some kind of data right uh till now there is no performance benefits of stateless components right uh if if you are if you are to look at the react code it still wraps around a class right uh obviously the react team is working on it to you know make it performant more than the normal component but then we it made sense for us right we didn't want it to handle the entire uh, life cycle method or the initial go and but we want to just try how react is working right so this poc and stateless component together was very helpful for us to create this footer component right and it was a very big achievement for us we we were ship, we shipped this code in a half a day's time and it was working like wow yeah and then we started porting small parts of the component right we decide you know which components are Uh, not so important uh, for the in context to the entire application. If, even if it breaks, it, you can wait for half an hour to fix it. Rather than something if you break, uh, like it is like if the product manager comes and bangs in our hand, you know what? What do you do? Right? You start with small, uh, four small parts of the code, uh, which are not so, not so uh, you know uh, important for us. And then we, you know, uh, when we are felt confident, when uh, we are uh, more knowledgeable about React, we actually migrated the entire application to. um uh, react uh, so the one thing i would like to tell over here is when we migrated the entire application to react we made sure that there is no jquery in our application at all like we even though if you are using some sort of libraries additional libraries we made sure that library doesn't have jquery as a dependency right uh, we wanted to create a carousel and react slick was one of the very you know uh, popular library out there we completely we didn't use it because internally it uses jquery as of now yes so it didn't use it so we were pretty sure that whatever we use we are not going to go back to the jquery life cycle because if somebody see jquery in our code they will be so prompted that you know let us just do it in jquery where not the react way we don't did not wanted to maintain two separate piece of code where people, some people are coding in react and some people are coding in jquery 
So over the past two and a half years, we actually worked on multiple projects. Uh, we have more than five to six uh, uh, live React applications, which are very heavy lifting. Uh, we have D3s and uh, MQTTs and sockets and whatnot. And this is something that we learned uh, over the past two and a half years, which worked best for us, right? Lint and guidelines are the most important part of your front-end application. That's what we believe, right? Uh, we were seeing that few people were using normal uh, functions, few people, few people were using ES6 arrow functions, and it was just complete mess. Like, you know, it was it was two different If Even we found out the same developer using two different pieces of code at different point of time. So we wanted to make sure this doesn't happen. Uh, so we made, uh, we created very strict ES guidelines. We follow Airbnb, and on top of that, we have added a few more uh, restrictions. We believe that you should create the smallest components possible, right? Very simply put, that is online and offline. That red and green, uh, like purple, is one of our components. It's just one piece of code which takes the color or the state, whether it's offline or offline, and just renders that purple, right? It's just we have these small components in our system, right? We believe this is the best way to go about it. Uh, because it makes sense, uh, because you can reuse obviously the component later on of time. But suppose some error occurs in some part of, uh, in any of your application, right? it's very easy to find out where the actually uh, stuffs are going wrong. Initially we hated JSX because again it was some kind of learning curve for us. Uh, but then now it, it is, we are quite okay with it. Uh, we like how JSX works and obviously the ES6 feature that comes along with. Uh, yeah. And then flat states, right? So uh, we have seen uh, plenty of libraries out there which just uses nested states, right? We make sure that our developers don't create any nested application state. It is, should be as much flat as possible. The reason being, we wanted to use pure components over simple components, right? If, if, if you create a React ES6 style, right, you can extend a component or you can extend pure component, right? I'll just come back to the difference. Pure component has some sort of performance benefits, uh, so we have to leverage that. And obviously, if it's a flat state, it's very easy to manipulate, right? So we have to make sure the flat states, uh, whatever state you create in the application should be as much flat as possible. And because of which, you use one library called as normalizer. Uh, uh, it's said there. Uh, this library is a library where like, you, if you have a REST, REST API response, right? probably if you use any sort of REST uh, library, like we use Testify uh, in our backend, it, it, it will probably take some kind of DB and then give back to you. It probably it may happen that it has some foreign key references and the state is nested. Right? We use normalized library on top of every REST API to make it as much flat as, as possible. Right? We use that and then we try to extend pure components over components. Right? Pure component, what it does, right? Uh, if you see should component update, right? Uh, so pure component, what it does, whenever the state changes, right? It does a shallow rendering check, right? Uh, shallow depth check. It doesn't go deep enough to find out if both your states are same. Instead, it just overlooks and see if your primary set of keys are same, and then if it's same, then I, it's like no, I don't need to render it again. If it's deep enough. You, if your slates, uh, states are not flat, and if you use pure component, you run into a problem, many problems, right? Because it's, it's just a shallow, shallow uh, depth check of your uh, object, and then find out whether you should re-render the component or not. So this flat states and pure component works together. Uh, uh, it it gave us a good amount of performance improvement. I didn't show the numbers here, but it actually gave us five to six per percent of performance improvement over how each component re-renders, right? Who is vanilla flux, right? Uh, uh, when we are, you know, uh, started with our migrating our code to this React, we didn't use any sort of state libraries, right? It was all about props, uh, child parent hierarchy, right? Uh, parent will pass props, be it function, be it data, and then uh, child will work accordingly. If it needs to X, uh, like we want to talk about two, between two siblings, the uh, callers always via the parent. Uh, let, uh, one child will ask the parent, you know, I want the other sibling to do something. We are doing like that. But we found out it was uh, not so maintainable. And then obviously, if you start building uh, new features, it would become very difficult for us. So we started looking out for uh, supporting libraries, right? The first thing that came to us was Redux. Uh, and the one thing that uh, on Redux that was most popular, it is 99, 99 lines of code and just small, right? This was the most uh, talked about thing about Redux. Uh, it's a 99 lines of code and you can just uh, make it work in your application and it will start working away. Right? But we saw Redux is a very deep learning curve, right? 
and we were not so familiar uh, or not, not so comfortable with the one state uh, architecture uh, we wanted to have separate uh, separation of concerns right my user store should only uh, think about what the user data is there right you should not bother about how the user is interacting with some kind of my payment space right my user data should only talk about how the user data is related what is the email id also to them <laughs> so the very very last that give give us this fresh feature obviously the flux architecture works best secondly we saw that uh, almost all of our actions as i said before right were rest api calls right so if if you go if you are to go with data access right, we had to use any uh, middleware right i it was thunk at that time was most popular so we saw that anyway there is an asynchronous call we are not getting much of benefit out of the pure reducer function which just gives a uh, initial call back at the very beginning of your action so we went to add with vanilla flux until now we are vanilla flux company we don't use redux uh, we are quite happy that we have made the choice and it actually has improved the performance i'm not so sure if you are using redux not the correct way but the same application which is built in redux and flux we could see 10 to 15% of performance improvement on flux as well as flux gives you a very uh, good feature uh, called as how many events you can have in an application right you can number the limit of them right you can say i should not go beyond 100 of events uh, in my application and it would actually give you a warning while well, you know build time that no you have crossed 100 events at your application so it is very good for us this link uh, lead to us create our very own starter kit right obviously create react as great uh, when you start up but then we we thought that you know what are learnings we have and what works best for us what why not create our own starter kit right so we uh, we created our own starter kit right it gave us few uh, things right it made sure that whatever we learned for the last two and a half year right the best practices are the libraries and the stack we could put together in a one single package dot json and then it was it, it would start working for all of our projects right very simply put right if my flux is there airbnb es lens are there webpack configuration is there like you can just include gzip and all sort of stuff at the initial go itself and go ahead. again it gave gave us defined app structure right because we were creating multiple apps uh, at same point of time it was very easy for us to create a same app architecture and then different devs can work on different projects simultaneously because the architecture look is the same <coughs> obviously we created proven lens which works best for us right we are arrow function supporter and all sort of things it works best for us and the, the best thing we found in our own uh, starter kit is, is the build process right uh, we use jenkins uh, uh, as a build automation tool in our company uh, we are heavily using jenkins for our backend apps but we could not use for front end but with this own starter kit we created our own uh, build script right whenever you put something in your developer like uh, uh, a new code right it will start uh, 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 testing your application we use jest and istanbul uh, uh, start testing your application if it's if it's done it will start creating your bundle if it's done it will uh, obviously it gzip and all the stuff it will put in your s3 like we use uh, aws uh, for our all our s3 storage or so we directly put an s3 so this was a very good win for us right previously we used to see uh, like collaborate with different teams to find out whether your code is fine to go okay my code is fine to go let's just put together and let's release this made our life very simple right the simple build process has improved our productivity I can say like hundred percent. With oh, this starter kit, right? We thought that you know we found out that you should keep your front end application very simple, right? Uh, uh, I don't want to uh, sound very harsh on this, but it's very true that front end is very polluted, right? For anything and everything, you have hundred of libraries, even though almost all of them work the similar way or other way, right? So we wanted to make it very sim- uh, simple, right? So this is the few things that we learned over the past few years. don't use it if you don't need it right for the last uh, for the first one one and a half month of our uh, react application that right, we didn't need any redux or flux any sort of architecture right in fact now also we have few of apps that doesn't use any redux or flux or neither react route or any sort of routing algorithm because it just it doesn't make sense we don't need it, just, just don't use it uh choose extensibility over the ease of building right you may just import a uh, library which just gives a simple function but then if you want to add on some feature to it just it's you are just stuck you don't know how to do it right and that's why if, if you can do it just do it don't let it right like i don't remember the exact library name by this left pad or something like that which just opted out from npm and all people and all started fall it is eleven piece of line of code do you don't you think that it would have done done it by ourselves right 
I read this somewhere, uh, like I think uh, yesterday I was traveling by the train and I read this somewhere, like no one article, this front end is the future. And I believe it is, uh, because most of our uh, like user base that you see are very concerned about how the UI or UX looks, right? So UI is something that, you know, uh, how how you, you know, talk to your customer and all sort of stuff, right? So we saw that front end is the future and we are uh, thinking that it's true and uh, some sort of other way it's obviously uh, coming through. And if that is true, then we feel that React is the first fast forward to it, right? It, it two and a half year back, React was something else only. Like if, if, if you consider now Vue and all other languages come up, but the two and a half year back when we started React, it was some other level of confidence or some other level of API beauty that you could see. And it was it was something of other level, right? Yeah, that's that's about it.